Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to Wealth Track premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to wealthtrack.com for more information. Thank you. This week on Wealth Track, a mild mannered mutual fund manager with a Superman track record. Great investor Don Yachtman of the Yachtman Fund scans the globe for dominant companies selling at deep discounts. Where is he finding them now? Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Did you know you can take WealthTrack with you? You can watch full episodes, you can watch the highlights or read the newsletters whenever, wherever. Let me show you how. In your web browser, type in m.wealthtrack.com. That's it. So join WealthTrack whenever and wherever you can. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. The only predictable thing about 2012 is its unpredictability. So wrote Mohamed El Arian, the CEO and co-chief investment officer of bond giant PIMCO in a recent Wall Street Journal editorial. That is a sentiment shared by many on Wall Street and Main Street. Markets hate uncertainty is a market cliche that seems to be playing out. Unpredictability has led to a massive outflow of funds from stocks to the perceived safety of bonds for several years and is one of the reasons that even financial advisors are reluctant to increase their clients' stock holdings. According to a recent survey by Investment News, a leading publication for financial advisors, only 44% of planners plan to increase their clients' allocation to U.S. stocks this year, versus the 63% who said they would increase their allocations to stocks overall last year. Just 19% said they would recommend increasing client exposure to international stocks, versus 60% who did last year. Undermining investor confidence is the fact that active stock fund managers underperformed the market indices for the second year in a row in 2011. Only 21% of large cap fund managers, for instance, did better than the Russell 1000 last year. Only 20% outperformed the year before. The average large cap fund lagged the Russell by nearly three percentage points in 2011. Enter this week's great investor, WealthTrack guest, whose experience is the opposite and could not feel more differently about the prospects he sees in the stock market. He is Don Yachtman, co-portfolio manager with his son Stephen of the nearly 20-year-old flagship Yachtman Fund and the newer Yachtman Focused Fund. Both value-oriented funds are rated five-star by Morningstar and have beaten the markets by a wide margin since inception. The Yachtman Fund ranks in the top 1% of its category for the past three, five, 10, and 15 year periods. One of the reasons the team was a finalist for Morningstar's Domestic Stock Manager of the Year Award in 2011. And unlike so many of their rivals, the funds have been attracting new investors. Another difference between Yachtman and many of his peers is the opportunities he sees in the market, which he calls amazing. I asked him why. I've been doing this for over 40 years, and I can't remember another period of time where I've seen so many high-quality, profitable businesses uh, selling at prices relative to the market this cheaply. And just to give you an illustration, the 30-year Treasury today has a lower yield than many of these companies like Pepsi or Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble, etc. And uh, that's a very unique period of time. Relative to other options, but what about in real terms? I mean, you know, certainly at 11 or 12 times earnings wherever the S&P is selling at mm -hmm. now, I mean, that's not historically like really cheap. I think in 08, the bottom of 08 and early 09, that stocks were absolutely cheaper. But on a relative basis, a number of these companies, like say Procter & Gamble, 
sells at almost the same price it did in the fall of 08. And here you've had three years and a half now almost of growth in the dividends increased and everything else. But the cash flows are much higher. They're much more valuable than they were then. So as a value investor, it is the best value to be found in, in these you know, large cap kind of brand name companies. Is, is that really where, where you're finding the best opportunities? It is. I mean, if you look at our process and how we go to, to achieve that, we have three goals. The first goal is to preserve our clients' capital. The second one is to make equity type returns, double digit type returns. And the third one is to beat the S&P over a full market cycle. And a full market cycle is how many It varies, years? so we'll, we'll use 10 years because that will contain any cycle. And then from that, in order to achieve that, what we will do is we will look at forward risk-adjusted rates of return. Now, that sounds complicated, but basically it's like behaving like a bond buyer. So you put a forward return and then you put a quality rating on it. And what we're seeing now is, in effect, the so-called triple A's of equity, things like Coke and Pepsi and things like that, have these very high returns relative to other things. And so why would one go to lower grades when they can stay with these so-called AAA type bonds, only they're really equities? Let me ask you about the whole thesis of equities uh, for the moment, because I think a lot of investors, unless you're a professional investor, you have to invest in equities, regardless of the fact that they might look relatively cheap. The volatility that investors are seeing in the market has scared a lot of investors away. Mm -hmm. And so how do you view the volatility that we're seeing in the market in your 40 plus years of investing? Is this a much more, you know, risky time? Is it a harder time to invest? What's your view? It's more unpredictable, uh, the overall economy and things like that. But there are a lot of things one can control uh, and a lot of things one can't control. So we try to focus on the things we can control. And most of the companies that we're finding of, that are good value have relatively predictable cash flows. And so, again, why do you want to downgrade if you can get the highest grade at these kind of returns? And uh, we feel very, very comfortable on a relative basis, certainly. Getting double-digit returns has not been possible for most managers mm -hmm. on a regular basis over the last several years. We had terrible years in, what, 2008. Uh, we had a much better year in 2009. Uh, so, you know, again, the, the returns have not been predictable either. So, so are the, the investment returns that you can really expect to deliver over a market cycle the same as they've always been, or have you had to set your sights lower? Yes and no. I mean, I think inflation as it comes down means the real returns uh, are still there, but you don't get the, the, the nominal the returns pop. because mm -hmm. of the inflation uh, part of it. But no, I think the process is, is repeatable, what we're doing. And think of it just very much like uh, what somebody would be taught in a finance course in graduate school, that you'd look for a hurdle rate, and then you try to find things above the hurdle rate. And if they're there, you should invest the capital. And when the capital is all invested, then you should start to, to look at things on a relative basis, like we did in late 08, where uh, we were willing to sell off a high quality uh, stock for a lower quality stock because the, the spread had opened up so enormously. And so something like News Corp and Viacom, which are still good quality companies, were, were providing, we thought, 20 plus percent type returns. So we were willing to sell off Procter & Gamble that uh, had low double digit returns. And so did News Corp and Viacom, did they deliver that 20% that plus returns that you expected from them? On the long term, we, we, yes, and then in the short term, even more dramatically. I mean, News Corp has more than tripled from its lows, and Viacom has also, as an example. So, so News Corp is, you know, again, one of those, those companies that, you know, given the scandal the, uh, that they had with the phone tapping in the UK and... Mm -hmm. The, the problems that the, the Murdoch empire has had because of that. that. So in a situation like that, where that was new information for Yachtman as well, what made you decide to stick with News Corp? It was, but it wasn't new information. In other words, that had been revealed some time ago. It was just re-emphasized in the press. That was a very tiny piece. News of the World was like 25 million of operating profits and declining as, because we're changing, the media business is changing. 
we look at not only the price but the business model and what we really like about News Corp is the fact the business model is moving more toward a fee-driven business and away from an ad business. The big driver in News Corp is Fox News, which is now bigger than MSNBC and, and, uh, CNN. and CNN combined. And, and you're moving toward uh, fee-driven revenue streams because of the uh, cable fees on that. That company is getting stronger in our view. And so we saw that as an opportunity and we thought we actually got a bonus out of it because what concerned us is that they might overpay for B Sky B, which they own part of and were considering take, trying to buy the whole thing. And they were forced into buying back their stock, which was at a cheap price. As, as Plan B, and we actually like Plan B better than Plan A. <laughs> <laughs> so were you behind the rumors in the UK or whatever? <laughs> no, no. no, that just happened to work out for you. Let's talk a little bit about protecting capital, because again, from an, if you haven't really analyzed the market and individual issues, it looks like it's more difficult to protect capital in the stock market now than it, than it has been. Is that the case, or, or is it you can still tell your investors that yes, we can protect your capital even in a vol very volatile market? Yeah, I, I don't think that's any more difficult. I, I, the, actually, I would argue that volatility is the friend of a value investor because it creates opportunity. And there's, think of it as like a storm that you have in, in say, like a fruit orchard. And when the wind comes blowing through, some of the fruit gets knocked from the tree down to the ground, making it very easy to look at, and you can pick up the good ones. And it's a lot easier to pick them off the ground than it is up on the tree. Let me ask you about some of the things that, uh, you know, that you've been doing uh, as, as well over time, because you, you are a long-term investor. You know, I think what you told me, your turnover rate is about 20% mm -hmm. overall for both of the Yachtman funds, mm -hmm. and which means it's a, your average holding is about five years. So um, top 1% of all funds in the, in the last 15, 10, uh, five and three year periods with the Yachtman fund. How, how have you done that? What are you doing differently uh, than your competitors are that and it has been, have enabled you to, to stay in that top 1% of all funds? I think more than anything, it's, uh, it's a combination of objectivity and horizon time. We're, we're very patient, we're very long-term investors. Conceptually, what we're doing is buying beach balls being pushed underwater and the water level is rising. And so if one has the patience to stay with that, then eventually the pressure will come off and the longer it takes, because the water level is rising, the more the bounce will be. But uh, horizon time is a huge part of that. I know there are a lot of people who would like to buy certain investments that they look as, as good value for their clients, but they're worried that they won't look good for the next quarter or the next year and that they might get fired because of that. And so this longer horizon time, uh, we're just willing to stay there because we know that it will stand the test of time. One of the, the things that you and I talked about a year and a half ago when you were last on WealthTrack was the fact that we were talking about how, from a value investor point of view, that one of the things that enabled you to, to actually get through the financial crisis as well as you did was the fact that you did avoid the financial sector, which was a value trap for a lot of other uh, value investors. But I noticed that, that you're moving a little bit more into, the, into some financial service companies now. What's changed? Well, the values. The values have changed. And w you'll notice that in, in the bulk of the movement, it's been more toward the fee-driven side as opposed to the spread-driven side. U.S. Bank is bigger than most of the other ones combined. But uh, whether it's that or a, a, or a tangential kind of investment like H&R Block, and then coming back again to things like uh, New York Mellon or Bank of New York Mellon, I mean, or uh, Northern Trust or State Street, or, or even Goldman, Goldman Sachs. Sachs, right? Right. And we have a little Bank of America even in there, but in all cases, you'll notice they're very small positions, and we spread the risk. Uh, sometimes when you when things are less predictable, the way to deal with that is to have a smaller position and allow for a greater spread over what your normal hurdle rate would be to allow for that uncertainty. So, so t t tell me, what do you mean by a greater spread? A higher rate of return expectation. In other words, if you're interested in a company, let's say a Goldman Sachs uh, or a, a, a you know, Bank of America, uh, U.S. Bank, whatever, so you'll take a small position in that, but you're you're expecting it, the return to be greater? 
and that's why you're taking a smaller position? I'd oh yeah, that sounds uh, incongruous. No, I'm, what does. I'm saying is that the, outcome, uh, the outcomes can be much wider, the array of outcomes. In other words, you could have a real disaster or you could have a spectacular upside. I see. And so as the array is wider, what you end up doing is attaching probabilities to those outcomes, come up with a, a, a centrist rate of return, and then you want that to be uh, quite a bit higher than what a normal rate of return would be based on the risk. But the more risky things are, in other words, if you're going to drill for wildcat oil wells, it's probably a good idea to spread your risk over several oil wells as opposed to just putting it all into one. Uh, the more knowledge you have and the more comfort you have, that allows you to put a bigger position in like, like we have in PepsiCo or News Corp. Let me ask you as well, because I, I know that, that you tend to focus um, in, in both the Yachtman funds. Obviously, the focused fund is more focused, mm -hmm. but in the Yachtman fund itself, so what the top 10 holdings are, any, are like 50% of the portfolio, is, is that correct? correct. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of the other, I mean, companies uh, that, we, we mean, we've talked about News Corp, I mean, Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, Cisco are, are among your top five holdings. Um, what's the, the rationale with, with those companies in particular? Well, in, e in each case, what you have is a highly profitable company uh, that's selling at a low price. That, that's really what it boils down to. And we've talked about uh, some of these, but I mean, like Microsoft, uh, wh what's interesting is like if somebody had told me back in 2000 that we would own Microsoft, Cisco, and Hewlett Packard today, I would have laughed, uh, and, but yet Microsoft's less than half of where it was then. Cisco has been as, as low as 20% as of where it was in 2000, and Hewlett Packard half again as, as to where it was in 2000. Now think about that. You're now 12 years further along. These companies are bigger, more profitable. It, it's just that they were grossly overpriced, and, and they've reached the point where nobody wants to even talk about them anymore. They've had it with them. You know, they've lost all. Every, you know, everybody right. said, "I've lost money. Why do you want to own that?" Well, that's what make, creates opportunity. And now, by being objective and looking at the forward rate of return, we see a lot of value. How important are overseas earnings uh, to, to in, in the equation? And uh, and you know, given the fact that we've we've had a number of discussions on Wealth Track about kind of the macro picture, and in fact, right now, the U.S. is doing better than Europe for instance, mm -hmm. emerging markets are starting to slow. So, so, so what's kind of changed in, in the way that you approach businesses and what you look for uh, in businesses as, as far as their, their global reach? Well, I, th I think for a company to be a truly great company over the next 20 or 50 years, I think it, it's not so much the domicile as it is the footprint. And I think what you're going to see is there's going to be a U.S. footprint with 20 to 25 percent of the world's GDP in the United States, you need the volume to get the cost down, and so it's going to mean you're going to have to have some exposure in the United States. At the same time, you'll probably see more unit growth in the third world or developing world, and so there's a need to be in that area and to be moving in that direction and, and so that you can get continued growth out of it and transferring some of the opportunities you have in the United States overseas. Another issue that's, that, that comes up a lot is the fact that corporations have record amounts of cash. They are, you know, their profitability is at, at record highs as well. And so, I mean, how important is, is, is how they employ that cash, what they do with it? I mean, stock buybacks have, have been, uh, you know, have been increasing, at least announced stock buybacks have. Dividend payouts, you know, what kind of shareholder friendly uh, moves are you seeing on in, in corporations part that matter to you, that you think are going to enhance your value as a shareholder? Well, we look at, there are five options basically that a manager has. Let, let me back up a little yeah. bit, okay? When you buy a stock, what you're really buying is, is cash, a series of cash that comes in over a period of years. Now, as an investor, the, the first year's cash you can pretty well estimate. And the typical company, part of that cash is paid out to you in the form of a dividend. You know exactly what that is when you buy it. You can get a pretty good handle on, on what you can reinvest that at over a period of time. So the real wild card, so to speak, is what the manager is going to do with the bulk of the cash 
that the company is generating. And they basically have five options, and that's what we examine. We look at their record and what they do, not what they say they're going to do, but what they do. They can put it back in the business, R&D, marketing, cost reduction, distribution, etc. And marginal unit growth in dominant product categories is enormously profitable. Typically, a company that has a 40% market share doesn't make twice what a company that has a 20% share makes. They'll make four times. Wow. So that marginal unit growth is very, very important. Now, the problem is, and particularly with most companies that we have, as they start to mature, they can't grow their units fast enough to absorb all the cash. So now they have to examine four other basic options. Acquisitions. And that's a, that's a tricky one. And too many times we see the ego overriding the economics. I mean, look at Hewlett Packard, what happened with this, this, uh, uh, this autonomy acquisition, which they grossly overpaid for. We'd have much rather seen them buy back stock. So that's the third option. The fourth one is paying a dividend, and the fifth is just sitting on it or letting it build or pay down debt. So it's how they handle that over a period of time that does have a difference for a long-term investor. If you were to prioritize what you look for in a company that is generating cash, you know, how they utilize that cash. So, so what, what are the preferable, what do you look for? What are, what are the decisions that you favor? Pretty much in the order I gave them to you. The first most important one is protecting the crown jewels and growing the, you know, focusing on, on what you're really strong and growing that part. Um, and then if you can find the, that synergy in an acquisition where you don't overpay, and the same thing with buying back stock, Th those three probably are going to be far more important than, than the other two, paying and, a dividend. Far more or, important than paying dividends. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would. I, I think one of the dangers looking down the road again. It's it's fun to talk about these things, but we have to deal with them as they occur. But one of the issues is what happens to the tax rate on dividends, because if the tax rate on dividends goes back up, I, I've I've questioned a few companies and said, well, are you willing to? to eliminate your dividends. See, they're trapped in a way because you got tax-paying shareholders and non-tax-paying shareholders. And the, the problem is the, the tax-paying shareholders would just soon them can the dividend buy back stock, you know, if you're rational about it, because it would be better to have, to have your growth taxed in the form of capital gains than at ordinary income rates on the dividends if the Right, if, if the, if the dividend rate go goes up. up. So, so, you know, we, we always um, ask uh, about uh, our, our guests for the, if there's one thing that each of us should own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio, uh, what would it be? And, and obviously, we're, we've asked you on because the Yachtman funds have been such terrific investments, so you can't recommend your own fund. So what would it be? What do you think we should all own some of it in a, in a broadly diversified portfolio? Well, I, I, again, if you do what we do, Basically, what we're saying is the more money we put in an idea, the more we like it. So we have the most money in PepsiCo, so that would stand out. I mean, here you can get a yield higher than, than uh, long-term treasuries. They grew the dividend at 7% last year. Um, I think it's like shooting fish in a barrel. And what is it about PepsiCo, though, that, I mean, you know, of all of the other companies that you could own that have, a, you know, a a global franchise and you know have dominance actually they're not the dominant player in some markets coca-cola is Correct. So, so so what is it about pepsi-cola that's that, that you find so uh, attractive well I, th I think if you look over the I, i've of course watched this for over 30 years now and and uh, the business has evolved to a really nice business model and, and if you look at the individual components the biggest part, by the way, is Frito-Lay, and they could easily change their name from Pepsi to Frito-Lay. Uh, but each one of those major business components, Frito-Lay, carbonated beverages, Tropicana, Gatorade, Quaker Oats, all these are low capital requirement. They're products that, that are readily disposable. They have price ability to reprice the product. Uh, they generate high returns, and the prices of the stock is at a reasonable level. So, um, I mean, I, to me, it's just, I don't understand why more of it isn't owned by other people, frankly. <laughs> but, well, yeah. if, 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 it, if it does become owned by other people, you know, all the better for you and the Yachtman funds at any rate. So, Don Yachtman, thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track. We really appreciate it. Always illuminating conversation with well, thank you. Thank you. It's flattering to be with you, and I enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks.
At the conclusion of every wealth talk, we try to leave you with one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's Action Point picks up on Don Yachtman's comments about why and when to buy a stock. According to Yachtman, it is almost always about price. So this week's Action Point is have a cash reserve as part of your investment strategy. As we discovered through the financial crisis, cash protects your portfolio from losses in stocks and other investments during periods of market volatility. Cash also enables you to scoop up stocks and other investments when they are on sale. Over the last decade, the Yachtman Fund's cash stake has averaged 15% of the portfolio. It is in the low double digits now. The next week, we're going to be talking to another great investor who values the protection and flexibility cash provides. Our guest will be Matthew McLennan, successor to the legendary Jean-Marie Evillard at the First Eagle Funds. If you want to see our WealthTrack interviews ahead of their broadcast date, WealthTrack premium subscribers can now see our program 48 hours in advance, along with timely interviews exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. To sign up, go to our website, WealthTrack.com. And that concludes this edition of WealthTrack. Thank you for watching, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market.